This figure, from the late 19th century, comes from a people who live in the rainforest of Gabon, just north of the river Congo. It might not strike you immediately as an object of belief. Since the beginning of the 20th century, we in the West have tended to see these simply as African art or primitive art, and it is in this way that they are usually displayed in museums and art collections. But there are many other ways of viewing this object. To an ethnologist, it's part of the culture of a people. Its story may help us to understand how they see themselves, how they express their values and relationships, and how they see the world. But we can go a step further and see this as just one link in a whole set of beliefs about life, death, and how people relate to matters of ultimate concern. This perspective looks at the figure not only in its primary religious role in its culture, where it was the guardian of the relics of deceased family members, but as a token of human religious awareness, and it helps us to build up our map of human religious experience. These sculptures, from the Kota people, burst onto the European scene at the beginning of the 20th century, when around 1907 they began to inspire the work of Picasso. But it's interesting to see how Picasso himself remembered this encounter in religious terms. Men had made those masks and other objects for a sacred purpose, a magic purpose, as a kind of mediation between themselves and the unknown hostile forces that surrounded them, in order to overcome their fear and horror by giving it a form and an image. At that moment I realised what painting was all about. Painting isn't an, as an aesthetic operation, it is a form of magic designed as a mediation between this strange hostile world and us. A way of seizing power by giving form to our terrors as well as our desires. When I came to that realisation, I knew I had found my way. So what is the story of this figure? It comes from a subgroup of the Kota, the Hongwe. When people died, particularly those whom the community revered, their bones were gathered into a bark container, a boete, and on top of this bundle, tied through it through this opening, was placed one of these figures. It was not intended to be a portrait of the dead person, in the same way that we sometimes place effigies over a vault or photos on a gravestone, nor even a symbol indicating a particular individual, but rather it was a marker and a protector of the relics. It says, here is the precious source of power. These collections of relics were important in the initiation of young men into full membership of the group, and they were seen as giving their power to the group in times of need, danger and illness. It's 42 centimetres tall and carved from two pieces of wood. The face is one piece, the stand another. The face is covered with carefully beaten strips of copper that are less than half a millimetre in thickness. Copper which was used as a currency before colonial times, is both bright and attractive, and also can possibly be seen as reflecting back forces threatening the relics. This is a work of great expertise and represents a considerable investment by the family that had it made. Looking at it, brings before us not only a people, a culture and a set of beliefs about the world and life, 
but it reminds us how some fundamental questions are present in every human society. To a theologian, this poses the problem of language. When we want to think and talk about immaterial realities, we always have to do so using material things. Words, rituals, images, objects. Religion always needs a language we can relate to with the senses. This figure is a phrase in one such language. And these are languages of imagination, not description, of poetry rather than prose. The artefact is, in Picasso's phrase, a mediation of fears and desires. When we reflect on life, we often start by thinking of death. And we look backwards and tell stories about our past as a way of establishing our identity and our sense of where we are now. It is a process we can see at work in virtually every religion. Human societies, outside a very narrow band we call modernity, have always seen death as somehow more of a boundary between the living and the dead rather than a full stop. Many societies have some place for relics and somehow they maintain the link. But there are lots of other ways religions seek that link. Human beings confront a range of fears about what might go wrong, health and illness, childbirth, growing up, ageing. In most societies, these are faced with the twin approaches of practical action and religious ritual. This object draws together many aspects of human experience. But looking at it concludes not with an answer, but a query. How do we imagine these issues in our society.